everyone. Uh, as well, we'll go on to this in a second, but uh, I'll just wait for the nice AV guy to uh, turn my mic on. Is it? Hello? Hello? Good. Okay, sweet. Right, I'll move away from that. Um, hello, my name's Sarah Young. Um, I, I always say this, like, who am I? Um, I work for this small startup. Also, it's been a giveaway. Also, I'm wearing a T-shirt. But yeah, um, my, uh, I work for this small startup that you might have heard of. I don't know. Maybe not. Who knows? Um, I have been working for Microsoft uh, for the last couple of, uh, couple of months. I'm still quite new to Microsoft. Um, as um, I was just introduced, ooh, um, I am a, I'm actually um, a security architect, but my full job title in, um, in Microsoft is actually, let's get this up, Azure Secure, Cloud Security and Compliance Global Black Belt. That you laugh, that's my actual job title. Seriously, it is. Um, it really actually, ooh, that's a bit. Um, it seriously is. I'm going to like do this because that seems a little bit iffy just to make sure it's not mine. Um, so yeah, I'm based in Melbourne. Uh, I did used to live in New Zealand. I don't know, because this is New Zealand, I don't know if there's anybody I know here because it's quite likely there is someone. I don't know. <gasps> Ravi! Sorry. Um, I knew there'd be someone here that I knew. Um, anyway, so I used to, I lived in New Zealand for a long time until about a year ago. I'm now based in Melbourne, uh, but I've worked in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, I've kind of been all over the place. Um, I've worked in tech for about the last decade or so. Um, I do uh, use a lot of GIFs or GIFs. We're not going to go there. Um, about, um, we're not going there in this talk. That's not what this talk's about in my presentations. I like to think it adds something. I know some people think that that actually um, is a substitute for content. So I'll let you decide what you think about mine. Um, here's me being a black belt, of course, because I literally fight hackers. Um, I like to throw around. I know I do this when I'm abroad because I do do quite a lot of talks overseas. Um, I don't know whether I, re I don't personally really count New Zealand as overseas because I like to throw caramello koalas at the audience if you like answer questions. I know because we're in New Zealand they're not particularly exotic, but when I go to when I go to uh, like like the states and stuff, people find it really exciting. So I'm still gonna to give you the full experience. I'm still gonna throw ca um, koalas at you uh, if you answer questions. But you know, hey, a quick note on me. Um, this is, I do have a very common first and last name. Uh, Google my name with caution because you will find that um, I am not Sarah Young, the Christian author. I did see her book, as you can see. Um, I found that in Hawaii in CVS. It cost $30, so I didn't buy it. I just took a selfie with it because uh, I'm cool and I'm a professional. Um, more seriously, though, um, you may also see things like um, Sarah Young, the late 80s porn star. I'm not joking on that one. So like, do not look that up on a work machine, like, really. Um, yeah, so I've probably wasted like a good, oh yeah, um, I'm from Australia. Again, I don't count New Zealanders overseas, but a lot of people like to make the comment on is uh, uh, like, you know, are the dangerous animals in Australia? Yes, this will kill you, this will kill you. This is my American slide. Like people in the States really like to talk about how everything in Australia will kill you. Um, these will kill you, crocodiles will kill you. This really ripped house kangaroo will probably kill you. If you don't know him, he's called Roger and he died a few months ago. It like made the news. It probably made the news over here as well, knowing New Zealand. And then obviously, you know, there's like cockatoos that drink beer and stuff. So in summary, yes, everything in Australia is trying to kill you. I was umming and ahhing about keeping those slides in because I know we're in New Zealand and I know everyone here will have been to Aussie, etc. But hey, like, whatever. So, what am I actually going to talk about today? Um, I just realized I didn't start my timer. Oh well. Um, so, um, I, I reckon I've probably killed about three minutes just introducing myself and talking about chocolate and stuff though. So, I'm talking about container security and also in line with that, it's Kubernetes security. Now, it's, I, want, I, I say Kubernetes, I know there are other orchestrators out there, but in my personal opinion, Kubernetes is largely going to become the de facto. Now, if anyone wants to talk to me about Rancher afterwards or some other orchestrators, feel free. Um, I have my own opinions on those. Um, I did make this excellent poster. Um, as you can see, like I, I'm literally a pro at photoshopping. Um, there's me and Mr. Robot or Freddie Mercury, whatever you want to call Rami Malek. Um, if you haven't seen this movie, how to lose, a, um, it's not how to lose a container in 10 minutes, it's actually how to lose a guy in 10 days. Basically the premise is that Kate Hudson, whatever she's called in the movie, is trying to make 
uh, she's going to do an experiment where she makes all the dating mistakes that women commonly make to try and scare off Matthew McConaughey in 10, 10 days. So I thought, hey, I'm going to do an experiment where I'm going to see if I can uh, lose a container, make all the common mistakes that people make when deploying containers in 10 minutes. Now, when I started this, and I will come back to this later in the talk, I was pretty confident I could get someone to ruin a container in 10 minutes. Now, we'll see how that went later on, but this was the premise of my talk. Now, what I'm going to talk about before that, though, is good practices for container security and things you shouldn't do, because Obviously, my talk would be remiss without actually talking about those things. So um, I'm talking about good security practices for containers, Kubernetes, and related tools. I will also talk a lot about moving to the cloud, because often these things go hand in hand. I am aware that you don't have to move to the cloud to containerize things and, and start using orchestrators. But to be honest with you, I don't know why you bother. Um, I know I work for Microsoft now, but I am talking very cloud agnostically, because most of these principles apply to everything. So you know, I'm not here to big up Azure uh, today, anyway. So. Putting my talk into a couple of sections, I've got protecting your data, caring for your OS and your orchestrators, checking your privilege, shifting left with containers, and then I'll talk about my little experiment about trying to get my containers owned. So this pretty much sums up container and Kubernetes security for me. Not monkey emojis specifically, but hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. So what I find is, um, who in here is a developer rather than a security person? Hands up, hands up. Most of you, oh, most of this side of the room anyway. Great, cool. So what I find is, and I'm not ragging on developers because that is something security people do and it really annoys me. Um, but what I find is a big mistake that some organizations make is they're like, hey, our security, um, we can just do exactly the same thing. Because you know we're containerizing, why would we do anything differently? Um, you know, we can just use the same tools, we can use the same processes, nothing will change, it'll be great. This is not true. This is definitely not true. So, although now I'm going to talk about something very generic, I, I really need to reorder this talk. Um, I'm very excited that now I get to use the cool Microsoft Bit Raccoon stuff in my presentations because they're cute. Not because it means anything, but yeah. So, good data protection practices. Um, in the words of Mary Poppins, well begun is half done. Now, actually, that doesn't come originally from Mary Poppins. It actually comes from something else, but I've never been able to fully find out what it is. So we're going to go with Mary Poppins. Um, this is pretty basic, and you'll probably find it frustrating that I'm talking about the same kind of things that security people go on about time and time and time again. Um, which is tidy up your application. If you're moving to the cloud, if you're going to start containerizing things, tidy your application up first. Get your security hygiene right. Because if you, if you just dump a, an application that's full of, I don't know, like deprecated protocols, SSL, blah, 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 you put that straight in the cloud and you containerize it, it's still a massive security problem, right? And you're still going to have to do that at some other point. And if you're going to do this big shift, do it now. I know that you will have budgets, you will have time constraints, you have all of those things. But when are you going to do it? And some of these changes are actually pretty, pretty straightforward to do. And you know, do this. Remove your deprecated code protocols. Tidy up your code. Don't send things in the clear. All of these things. Like, tidy it up, please. Because people forget. It's all well and good saying, we're going to do machine learning, we're going to do AI, we're going to do, let's throw it out there, blockchain. Um, but you know, they don't even do stuff like um, get rid of your SSL. So you know, we, we really need to focus on getting our hygiene right first before we start containerizing things. It's really important. I can't stress this enough. So yeah, um, especially when you're moving to the cloud, um, we need to bear in mind the share responsibility model. Is everyone familiar with that phrase? Shared responsibility model? Doesn't matter what cloud, anybody not? No one wants to put their hand up, it's fine. So with, um, just quickly, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with it and you didn't want to put your hand up, which is fair enough, 
shared responsibility model is the definition of which part of the cloud you are responsible for. Now that will depend on whether you're using software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, or you've got your own private cloud. This is a pretty cool analogy that I stole from one of my colleagues who said I could. I have full permission to do that. Um, so a SaaS, software as a service, is like a hotel room. Basically, you turn up, use it, and everything's done for you pretty much. You just turn up and unlock the door. PaaS is like a furnished apartment, so you know they come in and tidy up maybe once a week, but largely you need to keep it tidy day to day. Um, infrastructure as a service is more like a rental, like you just get the apartment, but everything else you've got to furnish and do yourself. Whereas private cloud is like your house and you own everything. Now, a big mistake I see in security, in fact, one of the big major mistakes people make is not understanding the shared responsibility model and where their responsibility lies. So a lot of people I see make the make the mistake that, oh, my application is full of rubbish at the application level, but when I dump it in the cloud, it's no longer my problem. That's usually not true, and that's where a lot of misunderstandings come from. So it's really important to understand your shared responsibility model and understand which bits of your application you're responsible for. So usually containerization will probably sit. You're probably more likely to be in those middle two, PaaS and IaaS. It will depend a little bit on your cloud provider and, and your setup, but make sure you understand which bits you need to be responsible for because otherwise things fall through the gaps and that's not good. Because what happens is um, what we need to do is change our traditional security model. So we have the big old castle with the massive perimeters, big walls, but as soon as people get in, you know, it's a free for all. This is a nice castle, by the way. I really need to find out where it is. Um, does everyone know zero trust? Are people familiar with the phrase zero trust? Few nods, not, not enough. Um, that's not good. But um, so um, I needed to find, a, um, we're talking about isolation in the cloud and zero trust. So um, Google's, um, Google have made a big deal of zero trust. They're probably like the, the, the main people who started this off. Um, I needed a quote about isolation, and this was literally the only thing I can find. I don't think Jimmy Page was referring to the cloud, unfortunately. Um, but it is really important that we have zero trust. And zero trust is that every single um, item in the cloud, every single server, endpoint, whatever it is, shouldn't inherently trust anything else. So if someone breaches one thing, the idea is they shouldn't, or it should be difficult for them to move laterally. So no longer do we need a big, really beefy perimeter and nothing on on the outside, um, on the inside, we need this, we need zero trust between every single thing. And that's really important no matter what you're doing in the cloud. Ideally, you would do this on your on-prem environment as well and actually reverse engineer it, but like, I think that's me being like way too, uh, way too optimistic. But ideally, if anyone can do that, please do it. Isolating is the other really important thing that you need to do. So, caring for your OS and your orchestrator. Um, okay, do you care about your image? Not like, you know, what you look like. Um, you see, I, I'm very branded up today. I have um, a ninja cat and a dire wolf. It's amazing. Like, I saved this t-shirt especially for today. Even though it doesn't really fit me because it's a guy cut, but whatever. Um, if there's one thing with container security that you should be doing, it is this. Make sure you know where your container images come from. Please, God, please do this. I, yeah, don't mind me, but this is literally the most important thing. You know, you've got to minimize you, the use of images that you just pull from the internet. Even if you're pulling it from something like the Docker repository, the official repository, did you know that there were a load of compromised images on there? They got taken down after a few months, but they reckon that they've been downloaded, what, I think it was like 50,000 times before they were taken off. Anyone want to guess what was in the compromised image? I'll throw you a koala if I can reach you. Yes, I don't know if I'm going to go for it. Let's do it. Like, blah. Oh, yes. There you go. Thank you. Like, I don't know why I do the throwing thing because the room always ends up too big for me to be able to throw and I end up hitting people and stuff. But I've, my theory is it's like chocolate, so no one minds. Um, so you shouldn't be just pulling images from the internet. Um, now, I get that if it's your very first container image or it's your very first you know, particular OS image, you're probably going to have to get it from somewhere online. But then you should be checking it. You should be scanning it. You should be making sure it's not full of rubbish. You should be adding your tools, like using check marks, something like that, and then it should be going in a proper 
private repository. Now, all the major cloud providers have private repositories that you can use, and they're native to that tooling. So I would honestly just use whoever it is. Now, there are third party ones like Claire and Notary. Notary, I believe, just became something else, but I can't remember what it is. But bear in mind that you know, if you download a compromised image or image that has vulnerabilities in it, it's game over. It doesn't matter how much you've isolated things, you've already let your attackers in. Because we don't want like surprise attacks. Like, <laughs> I feel bad because I showed this. Uh, I showed this image. I think it's hilarious. But um, I did it. I did this talk at a meetup like last month, and a lady told me that she found this up. That uh, that she thought it was sad because the kid fell over and then I felt a little bit guilty. So I do hope that no one, like I found it amusing as opposed to sad. So I, I hope that no one doesn't like that. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to talk a lot about Kubernetes here. Um, like I said before, I know that there are other orchestrators out there. And feel free to come and talk to me about how I don't like them as well. But I'm going to focus on Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has really terrible default configs. Now, because it's uh, such a changeable uh, product and it's it's getting a lot of changes. Um, I mean, the older versions, like we're talking like 1.7, 1.8, they are terrible. Um, we're on now version 1.13, I think. Now that is a lot more stable, and a lot of these terrible defaults have been removed. But if you're already using Kubernetes, I'm not going to assume that you're using the most recent version yet. So, you know, bear in mind, some of these defaults are terrible. Some notable baddies, as you can see, are your secrets management is in etcd, and it's encoded in base64. Yes, that's secure. Um, and there's some other terrible ones in there. Um, the CIS, or CIS, Center for Internet Security, has got a Kubernetes benchmark, which is a really nice checklist of just going through and securing things. It's free, so go download it and have a look at it. Like, it's good. Um, I didn't really have anything much. The first time I ever did this talk was in Seattle, and so that's why I had Frasier, and I just like the dear God, because I used to really like Frasier. I'm a nerd. Uh, and if you're a Zelda fan, you'll know it's a secret to everybody. Um, that's my nerd joke. Sorry if you don't get it, and I hope you do. Um, don't bake, bake your creds and secrets into containers. It's, you know, it's like hard coding stuff into any kind of config or server or config file. Just don't do it. Um, you should be passing passwords and stuff in as, a vari as some kind of variable. Um, as I said before, Kubernetes stores its secrets in etcd encoded in base64. Like, I love this. This is one of my favorite version of this meme. Like, Sorry, devs, I'm not ragging on you, but you know the fact is some people do believe that is encryption, and we know that Base64 is not encryption. Um, all major cloud providers have inbuilt secrets management that can be used. I would just use that if you can. I'm a big fan of whatever cloud platform you're using. Just try and use the native tools because they integrate better. There are certain exceptions, I know, where you do need to use something different. Um, you might need to utilize a third party tool. If that's the case, fair enough. Sometimes there can be issues with key length and certificate length, but just use something. <laughs> use something that's reliable or well tested in the open source world. The other thing that doesn't get mentioned enough that I just wanted to throw in here as well is rotate your keys regularly. People do not rotate their keys regularly enough in the cloud. Now, how often you want to do that is very much, um, I'm sorry to go into this, a risk-based decision. And so you can go and ask your risk people to maybe assess how regularly you want to do that. But it really is important. If you've got really important information, you might be wanting to do it once, once a month. Maybe you only do it every six months. And I don't know. And also automate it with some kind of serverless function. Again, all the cloud providers have them. Don't do it manually, because I don't know why you would. That would kill you or me. I don't know. So here's my horror story. I have three of these. They are very vague, and I apologize. But they are things I have seen in real life, not at my current employer. I will just caveat that. Um, I still have to be rather vague, because I can't have anyone identified. Uh, so apologies, but I promise these are real. Um, so I saw a dev. He needed a slightly different image for his container. Just decided to pull it from a public repository, as you do. Any guesses what happened next? Come on. You can do it. I believe in you. I'll throw you chocolate. What? Come on. Bitcoin miner. No, I'm not throwing chocolate if you don't answer. I'm just saying. That's not how this works. Just, just so you know. So yeah, that's my horror story number one. So check your privilege. Again, 
talking about privilege stuff is, again, something that security people go on about all the time. Um, and if you know anything about containers, you'll know we talk about this a lot. Don't run as root, don't run as root, don't run as root. I couldn't find anything to go with root, so I put Groot on, because I'm cool and I think that's funny. Um, if you, I know there are some certain circumstances where you need to run as root, I know that. But the majority of the time, they're not. And I see a lot of containers where people run as root just because it's easier, which is not a good reason to do it. If you, there's a, probably about four or five reasons that you legitimately need to run as root. Only do those. Don't do anything else, please. And it, it's just not a good idea. Um, also, if you're running as root, you should be doing some kind of runtime security. I would advise you do this on your containers that aren't running as root as well, because why not? Um, there, are some, there are lots of tools out there that can do it. I'm not particularly mentioning one over the other. Some are open source, some are paid. So it's up to you what you want to have a look at. There's things like Aqua Enforcer, SE Linux, which again has been around a long time. It's not new, but it does work in a containerized environment if it's Linux. You've got AppArmor and SecComp. Now, I have had people say to me that SecComp is actually a real pain, but um, again, I'll leave it up to your discretion what you think. SE Linux has also got a bit of a rep for being really difficult to use, but if you haven't used it for the last three or four years, I would recommend giving it another go because it's actually got a lot nicer as long as you don't try and configure anything too custom. It's actually got better. So yeah, um, checking your privilege with orchestrators. Now, I've just got a picture of Clippy because I work for Microsoft, so I can do that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I just need Clippy in the in the presentation. Like, I didn't have anything else to put on this page. Um, again, I'm kind of repeating a bit of what I've said before. Orchestrators um, do have some real horrible things in the privilege. Again, I'm talking about Kubernetes. It didn't even have RBAC, which is role-based access control, until version 1.8. It, the, the dashboard had full admin privileges. I'm pretty sure that was a thing that did um, Tesla in, uh, in particular, last year. Uh, and if this sounds too onerous to go through yourself, just use a managed Kubernetes cluster. Lots of people offer them. There's no shame in saying, hey, Kubernetes is really new. We don't have you know, a, a fully rounded skill set yet within our team. Let's use a managed cluster from doesn't matter, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, whoever. Because the thing is, if you don't know how to secure it, like, don't just try and freestyle it yourself because you can end up with problems. And I do think sometimes this is more than a technical um, deficiency. It's kind of a point of pride that engineers are like, nope, I'm going to build my own. I have to build my own. But then you can end up making oversights because you don't have the knowledge. Like, use a managed Kubernetes cluster. It's OK. Kubernetes has only been around for like four years. It's really new. It changes all the time. Nobody knows everything. I was at KubeCon in Seattle in December, and even the, uh, the Google people who've been involved in the project since the word go are just like, we don't know everything about Kubernetes. It's become too big, too unwieldy. It's not possible to know it. So please don't like, discount using something managed where you know, a lot of the security defaults will be taken care of for you without, you know, just don't discount it. There's no shame in it. Horror story number two, um, a Kubernetes cluster, which was a test environment, was left open to the internet with all those lovely defaults. Anyone want to guess what happened? Yes! <laughs> who, said, who said that? I will like dangerously throw chocolate at you if you wave. <gasps> I'll, I'll come along a bit. So I feel like someone else shouted. Did someone else shout? You can come and get chocolate at the end. I'm not taking it home with me. <laughs> so yes, Bitcoin miner. Um, it, was, it was picked up re relatively quickly, so it didn't run up too much of a bill. And I don't want to give you the impression that this is the only thing that will happen, because it's not. But it is very common, and it seems to be the attack du jour is doing Bitcoin miner. Because you know it's an easy way to steal some bandwidth, and you can run up a terrible bill. Um, and contain your enthusiasm for shifting left. So um, you should be deploying a container or Kubernetes a wet security tool set. This is something I alluded to a bit earlier on. You shouldn't be assuming that your old tool set in security will be adequate for your needs. In fact, it almost certainly won't be. At a minimum, you'll probably need some additional plugins or add-ons so they can actually be container aware. And worst case, you may need to scrap them and start you know, 
afresh. So when I'm talking about security tooling, I mean IDS and heuristics, vulnerability scanning, SIEM, uh, runtime security, and auditing. All of those things you basically need to reassess, which I know is a pain, but you know, there's no point having tools that don't do anything, right? Um, and then that also goes for your getting your plumbing in order, your CI CD pipeline. Now, if you're moving to the cloud, you might not have a CI CD pipeline, so you're going from scratch anyway, which makes it a lot easier. But you know, you need to put tools in there and you need to do your research. I know that people are probably thinking, yeah, yeah, it's all well and good. You saying, do research, do research, because it's not like you don't have another job to do, right? But Really, it's so important. Like, go and benchmark your tools. Like, seriously, go and do it. And it should be a collaborative thing. I know it's a little bit cheesy saying, oh, security and developers, we should collaborate. Let's be friends. Um, but actually, we really should be. Um, it's really important. And as we more shift to the left and do more DevOps, DevSecOps, this is just happening. Because there's no point security okaying a tool and then it being unusable for devs. You should be doing a benchmarking thing together. Because we want to be like this, yeah, security devs. We love it, Ash and Pikachu, big Pokemon fan here. Yeah, don't mind me, uh, I'm a professional. Um, so horror story number three, um, I've seen an organization try and use old school vulnerability scanners on their containers and they were telling me, they were like, it's great, we've got no vulnerabilities. And I was like, yeah, um, that's cause like it can't see anything. Um, this was the original like Trump head shake uh, gif that I had on here, but then I changed it like earlier on in the year to this, because I thought this was a better failing one. Anyway, uh, last but not least, um, I did a little experiment to see if I could get myself owned. So I, um, I've been spinning up containers and Kubernetes clusters and just leaving them open to the internet. Um, now I did this on an unnamed cloud provider platform. It's <coughs> not Azure. Um, and, um, and I basically used a uh, one that would let me use PayPal so I didn't have to put my credit card details in because I was scared I was going to get Bitcoin mined. Um, so I tried to do the opposite of pretty much everything I've just tried to tell you to do. Oh yeah, because you see hackers. <laughs> I love that one. Um, so anyone want to guess like what containers I spun up that I thought might be particularly vulnerable to getting owned? <gasps> mm. Not Alpine. I did do Alpine, but that wasn't the one. I'll give you a chocolate for that. Any others? Hmm? What version? I'll give you a chocolate anyway. Oh, there's one more that's kind of an obvious one. Oops. Too far, too far. I've got skills, you see. This is, you see, I should have been in sports. Um, so I did. Um, WordPress and Ubuntu. 1404, which is full of holes. Um, and so what happened? Actually, sadly, this is nothing much happened. Like I left them there for ages. I even left the WordPress container with admin admin. I even left one that wasn't even configured so someone could go in and configure the goddamn thing. And nothing happened. But then um, I did see a tweet from Atticus. Atticus is uh, a pen tester based in Melbourne. She's an amazing public speaker, far better than I. And uh, if you ever get the opportunity to see her, I would recommend it. She tweeted this um, back in January saying, oh look, my WordPress site took at least a month to get owned. Then I felt much better because if Atticus couldn't get her stuff owned, then you know I don't feel so bad. Um, I have to say though, um, just, as a, uh, just as a note, it's actually a real pain to go and reverse engineer things to make them more vulnerable in the cloud. That was actually really difficult. So I was like doing the firewall and opening everything, etc. cetera. Um, interestingly, um, I did use, because again, I was doing this on the cheap. I used a tool called PSAD or PSAD. I'm not sure how you say it. It's an open source tool that looks at the IP tables um, of, and, and then does lookups and who is of the things that are scanning you. Uh, again, I used it because it was open source and it was free and it took me like two minutes to set up. What I did find interesting was that basically people use who is to do adverts on things. I particularly like the specially crafted and optimized for bandwidth hungry applications. My other favorite one was Security Trouble from China. Um, got some interesting scans, um, but yeah, nothing, no one seemed to really own anything, which was a shame. Um, but there you go. Maybe I believe that the cloud provider I was using probably did have a lot of protection that wasn't configurable. So that may have been something to do with it, but who knows anyway. So in conclusion, um, tidy up your application before you migrate or, and or containerize. Orchestrated defaults are terrible. Please change them. 
And please, 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 please make sure you know where your container images come from. Don't run as root unless you have to. Um, keep your secrets secret. Shift left, but make sure you've got the right tools to support this. And purposely trying to get hacked is uh, harder than one would expect. I always leave this as the last slide, and I'm like, this is a terrible last slide, because I'm like, you know all that stuff I just said? It's totally like not a problem. Please don't take this as your mind takeaway from my talk. It, it does, it can and does happen. Here are some of the useful links. Uh, there's the Sys Kubernetes security benchmark that I mentioned earlier. They've also got a Docker one. They do a lot of benchmarks, if you're not familiar with them, where you can go and checklist things. And um, the NIST special publication 800-190 is NIST publication on container and container security. NIST are the National Institute of Science and Technology. If you've not heard of them, they're a US government standard, a US government organization that writes standards. Some of their stuff's really inaccessible, but that one's quite nice. It's only like 10 pages. Uh, Liz Rice, who works for Aqua, and Michael Hausenblast, who works for Red Hat, wrote this Kubernetes security book. You can get it free as a PDF online. It's definitely worth a read. It's pretty new. Um, Microsoft have got some uh, stuff about security content concepts for Kubernetes. Um, although it says it's Azure, it's very generic and you can apply it to anything, so definitely look it up. And the tool I used for my lookups uh, is done by a guy called Michael Rash. Um, it's PSAD or PSAD, however you say it. And that is me done. Um, thank you very much for having me. And I don't know if I have time for questions, but if not, you can come find me at lunch. So thank you. <laughs>